Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. It's May 27th, and we are this morning taking a look at H959, a bill that was passed by Ways and Means yesterday. And this is the bill that addresses the statewide property ta tax, the yield, um, and basically funding education through the head fund uh, property tax. Um, and with us today, we have Representative Scott Beck, as well as um, Abby Shepard from Ledge Council. Um, shall we have Abby go first, Scott, or, or do you want to who, who do you think would be better going first? Well, I'll go. I'll go uh, first, and then if there's any, um, if we need to nitpick the language, um, Abby mm -hmm. can certainly pop in. But it's pretty straightforward. So well, that I mean, makes sense because we want to understand a little bit of your thinking that went into this as well. Yeah, I'll just I'll just do the nuts and bolts of the bill, which really mm -hmm. there aren't many to it, and then uh, go into a little bit of uh, the thought process. So, um, so the. What I think is going to happen today is this uh, committee bill will be introduced on the floor and then it will be called up for immediate action and second reading. Um, so basically the, the bill does, I guess, four things. Uh, it sets the, the yields and the non-homestead rate for FY21. And those yields are, uh, the property yield is 10,998 and the income yield is 13,535 with a um, non-homestead rate of a buck 62.8. And those are the, the numbers that voters were expecting when they passed those budgets back in March, uh, pre-COVID, okay? Um, and then it also it acknowledges that, um, that because of those rates and the decay of the consumption taxes in the fourth quarter of FY20 and a likely um, reduction in consumption taxes in FY21, that forces a deficit and it authorizes the um, education fund to, to enter into deficit in FY21. And then it prescribes a number of things that can be used to reduce that deficit. Um, they really are in no particular order um, with the exception of one, number one is the usage of federal funds to reduce that deficit to the greatest extent possible. And just to kind of fast forward a little bit, that deficit right now is projected by JFO in FY21 to be $156 million with a full reserve. Uh, also to deal with that deficit, the application of reversions, uh, the drawing down of the stabilization reserve if we chose to do that, other sources of revenue, uh, the reduction of costs, re uh, reduction of costs to the education fund, uh, borrowing pursuant to section three of this act, and that would be um, interfund loans in section three, and then any other source of funding, including the appropriations from the general fund um, or other funds. So those are all things that could be used to reduce that $156 million deficit. Uh, section three, authorizes the treasurer to use the interfund loans to deal with the deficit. Um, and it also um, establishes a date of June 30th, 2026 as the date when any borrowing uh, will have to be repaid, okay? Um, also in section four, uh, there are three compensations for overpayment for previous years. Uh, the Thetford School District is to receive one forty-eight thousand seven seventy-five fifty. The Town of Barnard is to receive forty-eight thousand eighty-one fifty-seven cents, and the Windsor Central Unified Union School District is to receive two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in four four sixty-two and eighty-two um, for an overpayment. Um, and this effect uh, section five is the effective date July first. 2020. Um, how this all plays out on the education fund outlook, if you're looking at that or have access to it. Yes. Um, uh, Avery, could you, could you pull that up? <clears throat> okay, great. She's going to put it on the screen. Thanks, Avery. So there, oh, that's we, the language. Let's get, let's, um, do we have the, the updated Ed fund outlook with these um, 
tax rates in there. I don't know. Chloe, yeah, I'll, I'll just need to pull that from the website. Just one moment. Okay, yeah, thank you. It's on House, House Ways and Means from yesterday if you, if, you, if you don't have it. Okay, thank you. Just while we're looking, Scott, that section four is just basically accounting errors that happened for those school districts between the that's, agencies. That's right. They, yeah, they were for a variety of reasons. I think a lot of it had to do with excess spending threshold. They overpaid. Mm -hmm. Now we're we're making them whole. That's right. And, and for we have a couple or three of those every year. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a part of the auditing and accounting process. Okay. Uh, thank you, Avery. So if you look, uh, the big numbers to hit on are um, at the top uh, line C, E, and F. That's the, um, the non-homestead property tax rate of buck sixty-two eight, and then the property and the income yield, which are ten thousand nine ninety-eight and thirteen five thirty-five. And again, those are where those numbers come from. Is those were the projected numbers in March after people voted. The, after the majority of districts voted their budgets and we thought we had healthy consumption taxes because we were in a pre-COVID environment. So those numbers reflect the budget decisions that people made and what they believed the tax implications of those votes were going to be. So we thought it was That's fair. Actually. We thought it was fair to, to hold them to that and not, uh, not punish property taxpayers for the COVID situation. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, just a couple of clarifies and a couple of questions, but just, just to clarify, uh, just to remind folks, when the yield goes up, <clears throat> that actually means that, uh, that it, it, it's a better impact on the tax rate. Tax rates go down, right. Yields, yeah. yields and tax rates go in the opposite direction. Right. Um, um, so, and then uh, the other important numbers to, to see here, um, if you look at um, uh, line 11, which is the education payment. That's the payment that goes out to school districts um, to cover what their grants and reserves and contributions don't cover. Uh, it was projected to be 1489.5. Um, it's 1489.5. So we're not, we're not shorting the districts any, any money. We're, we're giving them what their voters um, asked for, and what they said they, they needed. Um, Can I just stop you for one quick yeah. second? I'm sometimes going through this, there are questions, and Sarita Austin has a question. Yeah. Um, yep. Hold on one sec. Let me see how to unmute myself. You're on mute. Am I, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, this may be jumping ahead a little bit, but I'm, and it, you can wait to answer it. I'm just wondering how um, does the deficit, does the deficit, spending impact the calculation for the property tax yields like in 22 23 24 and 25 yes you are jumping ahead but i'll get okay. to that in just a second <laughs> okay thanks okay so you'll notice if you come down the sheet a little bit um in line 26 in the center column you'll notice that it's there's a 4.6 in red uh parentheses okay mm -hmm. and what that indicates that is that fourth quarter uh, fourth quarter consumption taxes um, and even a little bit of first quarter a third quarter just fell off the table and so we were projecting we thought we'd be about a 30 uh, you know full reserve um, balanced and the um, the reduction in consumption taxes ate up the entire reserve and then another 4.6 million dollars and so we're in uh, you know we're in in deficit for FY20. Um, uh, for 21, uh, we're filling the reserve back up to its full statutory uh, 5%, which is $38 million. And with doing that, and in addition, having the consumption taxes decaying, that forces a deficit of $156 million. And that is on line 31. Okay. So kind of getting to Sarita's question here. So 
how all this you know plays out in the in the long run um, is on well, the short term is that obviously um, it's my committee's position uh, that we want to reduce that 156 as much as we possibly can with federal dollars, either CARES Act money freeing up or some sort of subsequent legislation, HEROES Act or something else if it were to get through, uh, we would um, you know, hope that we could work with the Appropriations Committee um, to make sure that those dollars as much as possible um, reduce the 156 million or eliminate it. That is preferred, okay? Um, right now, as we stand here, uh, no federal dollars um, have been appropriated to the education fund. Okay. So how does that, you know, play out down the road? Well, what's going to happen is the, um, if, if we weren't able to get any federal dollars, or even if we got some, whatever that, whatever line 31 and the third column is, okay, that money is going to have to be borrowed from somewhere, whether it's inner fund or out on the market, uh, it's going to have to come from somewhere. And those people are going to um, want it back. And the treasurer has indicated that five years is her comfort level right now of getting it returned. Okay. So what happens in, so it's entirely possible in FY 22 and 23 and 24 and 25 um, that in 26, that the education fund is going to have to pay back that 100, that whatever's left on the bottom line there, 156 or some other number. That by its very nature will force property, to, that will that will be something that will be borne by the property taxpayers. There's nowhere else for it to go unless money comes into the ed fund from out, outside the education fund to repay those dollars. Okay. So basically, as we sit here right now, not having identified those other sources that could pay back that $156 million by definition, it will fall to the property taxpayers in those years. Doing the math. And that will impact yields. That will force yields down. But doing the, the math quickly on the principal alone, that's about, was it 31, 32 million? I lost it on my if we If we weren't able to, if we weren't able to reduce it with any federal funds, yes. Um, and what does that equal approximately? Can, what, how many cents? About three, it's about three pennies. About three pennies on the tax rate over the three, next three and year. Three three and a half, yeah. Just based on the principal, it doesn't include the interest, but, right. but better than perhaps uh, 23 cents in one year. Right. Which would give districts some time to uh, work through and plan. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's basically, it's, it's a matter of, do you want to, do you want to swallow $156 million in one year or do you want to swallow it in five? Okay, thank you. Um, questions? I, for one, will say I appreciate uh, very much you searching for ways to separate uh, the COVID challenge from uh, the, the, the property tax rate in, in a single year. Uh, I think that, that I really do appreciate that work. Um, I see uh, Larry Cooperly and then Dylan G. Batista. Hey, Scott, thank you. Yeah. Um, any conversation with regard to recessionary issues um, exceeding this period of time when addressing this bill in terms of, you know, other sources of revenue, et cetera. I mean, had, had that conversation come up with, you know, other than raising property taxes, 
how do we reduce this $156 million loan if in fact we continue to be in recession? So you're talking about other sources of revenue to the education fund? Should there not be anticipated revenue? Well, I mean, there is, anticip there is anticipated revenue. Um, we, you know, all of our consumption taxes are still in place um, and we will get revenue from them, although it won't be as robust as we had um, expected pre-COVID. Um, but I, there is no move afoot or there's nothing in this bill to uh, somehow create another source of revenue or expand an existing source of revenue to pour more non-property tax dollars into the education fund. Other than what's already there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I see Mark, did you want to respond in there before we go to Dylan? Um, I, I just wanted to point out that I, I got an, an email from uh, Bill McGill um, a few minutes ago, and the bill's going to be taken up on Friday. So you do have a little bit of time. Thank you. On the floor. Yeah. Dylan. Yeah, just a question, and, and this may actually be more for Mark, but Scott, I'm going to put it to you because you've been taking testimony here. So the education fund is a self-balancing fund. Each year it's put back into balance based upon the decisions of lawmakers um, and what we know to be true of revenues, and then we rebalance it as needed based upon the spending as the cycle moves forward. I mean, are there any recent examples within this education finance construct of, of having a deficit uh, within the education fund, because I'm looking at it and I'm not comfortable or uncomfortable. It just appears to be a pretty significant departure from a self-contained, self-balancing fund. It, yeah, I mean, it is a significant departure. I mean, it's um, not in, during my time have we ever, um, we've, you know, it's balanced every year. Um, I, Mark may have some knowledge going back to the Great Recession, 2008, 2009. I know that there were federal funds used to balance the fund in some of those years, but I don't know if the fund actually ended the year in deficit. Yeah, if I, if I could just jump in on that, um, I don't think there's any precedent for us having an actual deficit in the fund. There have been some years when the 5% reserve wasn't fully um, funded, but we've never used up all of the reserve and then um, got, fallen into a deficit, no. So, so just a quick follow up then, because that's the other piece I'm wondering is, um, and I'm just trying to process this through. I, I don't have, uh, and these are nothing other than first impressions, but if you have at the lower part of the actual ed fund balance sheet, you have things like reserves and so forth. What purpose is there to have an education fund reserve other than the statutory construct if you are now allowing a deficit to sit on the bottom line. I understand that there's a construct for repayment, but at a certain point, it, appropriating money to a reserve, if you have an outstanding loan imbalance that you need to pay back, to me, seems somewhat, um, somewhat challenging. I can't wrap my head around that. Yeah, you're, you're getting into financial philosophy right now, Dylan. And um, one philosophy is, is if you have a reserve, burn it use it. The other philosophy is, is if you have a reserve, use it as collateral to borrow and hold on to your cash. And you'll find that that's a very, you know, businesses do that all the time. When times are rough, you hang on to as much cash as you can, because you don't know what the future is going to look like. And that, and we had a, we had a long conversation with the treasurer and basically, um, whether you take it, whether you take it from inner fund loan or you take it from the reserve fund, you are borrowing it. And you will have to pay it back down the road. It makes no difference to the property taxpayer down the road, whether you're filling up the inner fund loan or whether you're filling up the um, education fund reserve. So the, the conversation with the treasurer was is that, you know, basically hold on to your cash because we don't know what FY22 is necessarily going to look like. We don't know what FY23 is going to look like. We don't know what this virus is going to do down the road or how it's going to affect our revenues. And so you know, that's kind of a, that's a, that's a, that's a strategy. When you don't know what's coming up, you better hold on to your cash. Yeah. And so just in response to that, I, I would say that's really helpful 
context to get um, as we think this through, because of course the education fund sits on its own outside of the general fund. And we all, I think, have pretty strong ideas of what it is or isn't, but of course we're in an unprecedented moment. Um, and so I, I appreciate the work of the committee to try to identify uh, a way within the fund to keep us on stable ground. And then the construct of repayment to me sounds like uh, belt and suspenders that we will do this and then we'll have to make decisions in the future based upon the unknowns of if we need to raise additional revenue or add sources into the fund to pay for it. So it's, it's a pretty elegant idea. I'm, I'm interested and intrigued to learn more. Thanks. Um, Sarita. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Yes, we can hear you, Sarita. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This may be for Mark. Um, I'm just wondering about any further consolidations of school districts and any future savings that might occur because of those consolidations. And I'm just going to throw this out there as Larry will like this as a pot, you know, just to think outside the box a little, if there were more consolidations, would that help out with this situation? Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how, how I can answer that question. Um, it, it goes in actually both directions. Sometimes consolidating in the short term results in higher spending rather than lower spending, but we don't have any, I don't think we've done any um, analysis and there's been no study done as to whether or not the consolidations that we've done to, to this point in time, how much money that might have saved. So I, I, I can't really answer your, your question. Yeah, I think the way I would answer that is, is that the, the virus and its impact on consumption taxes doesn't care whether districts consolidated or not. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it would lower spending. So not, I wasn't looking on the revenue side. Yeah, it was never really a reducing spending bill hmm. well it was and then we've tore something out of it but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> mark remembers those battles <laughs> um mark did you have something else you wanted to add no um i i do believe that there is going to be an, an amendment um scott beck i just i just happened to see on email that you were there, there is I, I just got yeah. a text from janet and it yeah. there is an amendment but i think it's Nobody's seen any language. She's got language. And okay, so great. It, it is there. And it does have to do with the waiting study. So my, um, my first Zoom amendment. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. So committee, um, let's, shall we have Abby just go through it? Make sure we understand the points. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, so I think that uh, Representative Beck just really walked you through all of the yeah. major points. Um, the only small legal point that I would add is in the discussion around the deficit. Um, Vermont's constitution does not require uh, a balanced budget. So there is notwithstanding language within this to make it absolutely clear. It's the General Assembly's intent to allow a deficit, but it's not entirely clear that uh, there is any constitutional prohibition against running a deficit. But as Mark said in the past, I believe the general fund transfer is, has helped to balance the ed fund. Um, so that's that's the main point I wish to make. Um, really, it's, it's a fairly short bill right now. There's a lot packed in. Um, I think Representative Beck pointed out that for any deficit that is incurred, um, currently this language requires it to be repaid by the end of uh, 2026, June 30th, sorry, the end of the fiscal year. Okay, and we don't have, that's a, that, that stands with the general fund as well. We don't have any constitutional amendment about balancing or, or deficit spending or anything in, in our general fund as well. Correct, we're one of the few states that doesn't require a balanced budget. That I, um, I would have to check on that. I'm trying to remember, Mark, or, uh, Jim, we had looked at this um, just trying to remember what I think that has a provision requiring some balancing. Is that correct, Jim? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to look up an email chain that we had discussed. Sorry, this. I've been typing this amendment <laughs> and not listening as close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I'm doing the same thing. Yeah, it's right. a, so it's okay. I was I was just referencing um, the general fund and the comparison of general fund and the ed fund, but it's it's not essential to what 
how we yep. respond. To I will this. follow up with you. We yeah. had looked at that. I just don't know off the top yeah. of my head. I think it's it's a slightly different treatment. Yeah. So, uh, there aren't any other questions. Can I just take a straw poll on um, support for the committee's uh, work? Um, a straw vote, that is. And perhaps we can do it by hand raising. So if you are in support, virtual hands or, or literal hands, virtual hands, if you are in support. Can I, can I ask one question? I'm sorry to yeah, interrupt. Please, I'm just please. curious. What, so was there a vote in ways and means? I might've missed it. The vote in ways and means was nine zero two. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, and I, I guess I, I'd just like to make a comment if I could. Uh, please. Just as a as a as a school board member, uh, this proposal is allowing school districts to start this ne next school year with one piece of major case. So much going on that the ability to start not under the threat of a twenty two cent tax increase is going to be incredibly beneficial. And I think it's important to note that I just had a school board meeting last night and without my prompting, um, the discussion really fell to knowledge that this deficit is, is looming out there and that in FY21, meaning this next school year, we have a budget, but we're gonna need to save as much money as possible during that to build up our reserves to prepare for what will be a very challenging FY22. The budget work for that will begin October, November, December. So uh, this gives some some very needed breathing room, but it doesn't ignore what we're going to be facing in the future. Thank you, and I think also it will provide some release for uh, voters in the 19 districts that, uh, when they're going to vote on their uh, school budgets, understand that they're not looking at a 22 cent average tax increase. Dylan, did you have something else? Yeah, just the, the only other piece here, because I've been trying to figure out what this construct would look like um, as we set up for next year. And I think Peter identifies something really important is providing a signal to the field that there will be stability. Um, and I think that our messages from Montpelier are extremely important right now. And I assume this one will be broadcast, but also within the fund that we are dealing with a really extraordinary situation um, where we may in fact be able to use uh, coronavirus relief funds um, if we can determine that they are appropriate to uh, deal with this structure and this construct that we're setting up so that it is not something uh, we are dealing with in future years for the full term. So I think that the intent language is particularly helpful, uh, declaring our intent to retire this loan, uh, but also to keep the construct as is. And I think longer term, just as we move forward, um, it's not as though education finance reform ever goes away. So we'll continue to have those conversations. But for this moment, providing certainty within the current construct to me is the most important thing. And so I'm prepared to support this proposal when we do the straw vote. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I'm Kate, yeah. this is Caleb. Yes, please. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to comment uh, similarly that, well, echo what Peter and Dylan said, but just to, I see this as providing certainty for the mechanisms that govern uh, education finance. And as Peter says, it gives certainty to some districts, but it doesn't. I, I would say this is more of an opportunity than an opportunity for a further solution. And I hope that um, equity just, you know, in uh, around the waiting study and things like that, so as it pertains to the amendment today, which I'm not fully obviously familiar with, but I'm aware that that conversation is um, one that people want to have as we kind of talk about this big crazy change to the ed fund where it's going to be unbalanced but 
Um, so just, I guess, to emphasize that this is giving us the opportunity to say, through this mechanism, we're holding taxpayers harmless. But to bear in mind that if we don't find another solution, it doesn't hold those same taxpayers harmless from debt finance or other things, even though that might be obviously way less than the 22% hit in one year, which would be just impossible. But um, I just hope that we keep um, working towards the next part of this solution and not feel like this important um, certainty that we're giving, I hope when we pass this as a house, uh, is by any means like uh, the last step. I think we should use the Corona relief funds um, or at least borrow against them, uh, regardless of what is clearly authorized. But you know, that's probably that's probably just me. But I've been saying that at school board meetings, so I'll also say it here. I mean, I think that those funds have to be part of the solution. Um, and thank you for hearing me out. Well, we we certainly know that the news from Washington uh, changes, and the way that we interpret it changes as as we move forward. We consider where we were two months ago and where we are now. It's just the, the understanding and awareness is completely different. Um, Sarita. Yes, um, I also just want to say that not only does it buy us certainty, but it also buys us time. And when I listen in on appropriations and ways and needs, you know, it seems like that's a theme that's running through at least the money committees is buying time so that um, they can gather more information and just kind of make more informed you know, uh, decisions about the future. So I, I, I think this, this uh, bill just also buys us time. It's also a solution, a short-term solution, but it also buys us time to see what's coming federally and kind of seeing how things evolve. And we will all be back in August. We'll have different information by then as well. Anybody else? Vice Chair, do you have anything to add? I think we're good. Okay. So we don't have possession of the bill, so I'm not going to take a formal vote. Um, but if we could take a, a hand raising uh, vote would be great. So um, all those in favor uh, uh, that's, that uh, support the bill before us, could you raise your hands? Oh, I should probably count myself. <laughs> so I have eight of us. I have Sarita, Peter, Chris, uh, Casey, Larry, Dylan, Jay, and myself supporting this. Um, okay, let's take your hands down. Lynn was waving. Uh, oh, Lynn is waving. Lynn, I'm counting you. Okay. <laughs> So take those down. And Kathleen is texting yeah. furiously yes as well. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> we should just do this as a roll call, shouldn't we? Probably easier. <laughs> so um, why didn't we just, just roll call this? It's probably easier. Um, so Peter and Casey and Jay, can you take your hands down? Kate, I'm gonna zip over to Ways and Means, but I yeah. appreciate the time. I think I think you should. It looks like they've she's taken of all the bills to take off the wall. S46 is a surprise. Is that in your committee now, or is that that's the way? I oh, that is. It, I, I heard it might be the basis for language for an amendment, but I'm yeah. struggling to see yes. how it's main. So I think there's. I think I'm missing something. Yeah. So it, it what it is. I'm looking at it. What it is is it's the ethnic studies bill, but she's put the waiting study on on the bill. So I, th th I thought that was in our committee, so I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks. I'll, thank you very much. All those opposed? Thanks, I see no one opposed. Um, I don't know if I got, I don't know if I got Caleb. Caleb, what, are you in support? Caleb and Chris, I, I, I think I'm missing your votes. 
Uh, yeah, this is Caleb here. Sorry about that. I, I haven't been on the phone much before <laughs> for these meetings. Um, yeah. I'm a little clumsy with my with my star six. And, um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know this isn't an official vote. Uh, but yes, yeah, it's I'm, a I'm, straw poll. I'm, yeah. to, for the purpose of the straw poll, yes, I, I'm all for it. Thanks for joining. Okay. All right. Is there anybody that I've missed? So I, I've got, yes, it says Caleb. Larry, Lynn, Casey, Chris, I don't know if I have yours. Yeah, you said mine earlier. Yes. Yes, okay. Dylan, Jay, Kathleen, Peter, Sarita. So I think that's, that's and myself, the none opposed. And, and Kathleen, who I also count here. So I, it looks like we're good. Um, we, we support this. Um, it would be a good idea to take a look at um, the bill that, um, and we're going to have to let the other folks go because they're going to, I, I would almost encourage you, encourage us all to go over and just observe what's happening in Ways and Means right now, um, to, for the, to see that being presented, um, and if we need to speak to that, um, this is the this is the waiting study that was part of Act 173, um, which brought us the report from Tammy Colby. The Senate uh, actually started taking that up. I think it stayed there. And the question, as as you may remember, this is the way that the, the waiting study is basically a, a, a zero sum game where all it really does is is change tax rates. Um, the concern going forward for some of us from the waiting study is it doesn't necessarily mean that the money is going to be distributed appropriately to those because they're, you know, there's poverty. Are our, our, our districts with high poverty simply going to go for the property tax or are they actually going to be investing it in children with, with uh, suffering from poverty? So um, there's, I know that there's some questions in that, that, that we have on that, whether it's better to address these problems through uh, a waiting study as we did with special ed, or is it better to actually consider it as forms of grants, which would ultimately affect your tax rate, but would also um, would direct money uh, to address the issues for which the waiting uh, was, was addressed. And some of the differences is in terms of if you look at why we moved to the waitings to uh, to a census based in Act 173, the amount of detail that you need to account for currently in the um, in the current formula, where you have to provide evidence for services, which involves a lot of bean counting, um, and to 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 be reimbursed, is very different from just saying we have X number of children who are living in poverty. Um, so at any rate, I think I am going to run over and sit uh, outside the Ways and Means room and hear what they have to say. And we are on the floor. Um, 11 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, I, I should probably also just speak to, did, did Larry, did we speak to the committee at all about uh, our conversation? We're, no, yes. we did not. No. We did not. Okay. Uh, um, no, that's, I think you up, updated us about your conversation we, yesterday with with uh, Senator Baruth and, and yeah. company. Yeah, and, yeah, and that, that we are that we're yeah. just waiting to go till August. We're going to wait so through uh, so yes, see, to see how the, to see how the votes come through. Right. Okay, so I guess we're good. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, I, I think part of the reason for that ultimately um, has to do with the fact that. There's a significantly more progress at the local level. Um, we have a lot more progress now than we did two months ago when we were actually looking at a need for the legislature to intervene. And because everybody is planning to vote in June, that perhaps the best thing to do is to let the, let the local process happen rather than have the legislature interfere. Um, so it's not a, a win-lose. I think ultimately, personally, I think it's probably our, our better solution. Um, and we will we'll meet again in, in, we'll know at the end of the month how many uh, ha have passed. I'm still waiting to hear about Rivendell and still don't have anything. 
Rivendell voted uh, yesterday, and I don't have any news on that yet. So we'll be watching. Kate, that. Kate do you know how they voted? Uh, I um, I think they were Australian ballot. Meaning, but by mail. Uh, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Right. Um, good question. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. But we should and get Dylan, one is one is the Essex vote. Uh, next Tuesday, so I'll be tabulating ballots. And you know, just just in an update, I know I talked about stuffing ballots. Um, we put many many thousands into the mail, and I haven't heard any complaints yet. So that was all the justices of the peace and our clerks. Really incredible effort. So we'll see how Tuesday goes. A lot of yeah. fraud out there. <laughs> Troublemaker. Only, only in the nursing homes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all so much. I'll see you on the floor. Um, and appreciate appreciate your attendance. Okay, just I, I think I may yeah. have missed it. Uh, this is coming on Friday, though. The, the yield bill will be Friday, not today. The yield bill will be Friday. Friday. So there will be time for thank us to also hear, hear more about the um, amendment. So there, there may be, I, I may be getting in touch with you to meet right before on Friday, unless Thursday is easier for people. I don't know. Who would rather meet on a Thursday than on a, um, than on a uh, Friday morning? I would Who's prefer Friday morning. You prefer Friday morning? There's one. Yeah, Raise your hand same. if you prefer Friday morning. All right, that's enough. <laughs> so it, it's, I think it's nine o'clock Friday morning um, that we'll probably meet and hear that. Um, it, so, and um, by the way, I'm just seeing Dylan, you had some thoughts about um, hearing about um, graduation ceremonies. Is that correct? Well, I. I mean, I, I think it's a delicate balance because uh, plans are in process for these, but I have heard from some parents who have said uh, it appears that some of the agency guidance is different from the large group gathering guidance uh, that is applied more broadly statewide by the Department of Health. So I don't want to uh, stir the pot here, but I do think it's a question that we will be hearing more about. I'm not sure if it's the right time for us to take testimony or not, but just wanted to make the suggestion. It is a topic I've heard a little more about in recent days. On Friday, we have, uh, we're going to be hearing uh, more about the teacher licensing bill that is on its way to government operations. Um, just to clarify that, um, Jim, you, I think you were, I was going to ask you to look in, look into some of the information that came from questions uh, related to um, licensing as well. I think well, it was I heard, more criminal. I heard that conversation, uh, Chair Webb, but I'm not sure exactly what questions you want answered. So if you could just text me or yeah. you know that'd if, be helpful to prepare. I think it was mainly Kathleen and Sarita. So Kathleen and Sarita, uh, if anybody has questions about better understanding about um, criminal background checks or something that might fall more oh. under um, under There's a whole, uh, whole subchapter on criminal background checks, which I can run through with, with you on Friday. Yeah. So please, anybody, feel free to text text Jim and me if you have questions related related to that, so that we can address that. And Serena. And yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. I just wanted to say my question was in terms, Jim, of substantiated when they were looking at evidence um, in the predetermination in the first round of a applicant applying. Um, when it's substantiated, is that does that go through a court or how that that was the question I had in okay. terms well, of that's what it's not answering right now if we could put that forward. Yeah, but that, no, but you. I just wanted him to know that's what my question was. Okay, great. And uh, Kate, I was wondering about the schedule of the other bill, um, the, the um, healthcare negotiations bill when they're taking testimony do you know it can you just just shoot an email to all of us if in case we want to follow sure, testimony. sure have we asked someone to sit in that committee yet no we haven't okay is there someone that like would like to 
uh, participating. I'm, I'm going to follow it no matter what. So I'd be yeah. happy if, to, okay. to be part of that. But if other, if I'm happy to just watch it on YouTube, if other folks would like to be our sit-in representative. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Peter. Appreciate it. And thank you, Sarita, yesterday for sitting in with government operations. Okay, so I guess I'm going to be probably, we're all going to be watching, I think I'll end up just watching the YouTube on um, later on, on the uh, Sibelia Amendment. What time are they ta taking that up? At Ways I think and Means? right now. Okay. I thought it was right now. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, and we're on the floor. What time are we on the floor? 11. 11. Today. 11. Okay. Okay, time to go take a quick walk. <laughs> See you all at 11. See you at 11.